My name is Sal Rees. I was born in South Wales in a little village, coal mining village in South Wales, um, 1937. Uh, we moved, moved over here in 1937 for Dad to come to work in the mines over here. Um, I went to school at Pizan. I was born and raised, no, we were raised in Pizan, sorry. Um, went to school at Midsummer Norton Grammar School, which I didn't enjoy doing, going to school. So I left when I, when I could at 15. Uh, after working in a tiny little radio shop for a couple of months, I decided I wanted to go underground because uh, I had a friend who was earning two pound eight and sixpence, which is in old turn, two pound 42 and a half P uh, for five days work. And I was doing six days work in this shop for one pound 50 or 30 bob in old money, one pound 10 shillings. Uh, I applied for the code board, and I was granted the position. I then had to go home and ask or tell my parents uh, that I had applied for this job and got it. And I was expecting a bit of criticism from them because they, dad was already a miner and I didn't know if he'd want me going down there, you know. I mean, I didn't know what it entailed actually. It's coal come out of the mines and the chaps come out of their black. So obviously it was a dirty job. Um, so I then went to work at the same pit. No, I had to do a 16 week training period at Old Mills um, because everybody had to do a 16 week training period to go in the mines. Uh, and then I went to the same pit as dad was working at. Um, well, I just progressed from there. Uh, that was when I was 15 years old. Um, and you presumably you want me to t tell you about, you'll cut this out hopefully, uh, about my mining career as opposed to my life. Oh no, I mean all of it, yeah, yeah. All of it, right. uh, oh, But I'm, I'm, so, I'm just interested, you said you didn't really enjoy school, why do you think that was? Yeah. I don't know, just the uh, intenseness of it possibly, because uh, you had a grammar school, you, was, uh, you were supposed to learn a lot. And I, I didn't see that as my vocation. I was more of a physical, thing than a, a mental one, you know. I was intelligent, obviously, because I wouldn't have got past the exams to go there, but I just didn't want to be inside working as such. <laughs> I'd say that when I then go and work down the mine, but um, I didn't want to have to work with my head rather than my body. Well, was your dad quite a physical person as well? Then, um, the yes, well, he, he worked in the mines um, after the war. During the war, he worked at the dumps at Mitchman uh, Bath, uh, with the ammunition and all that. But then when that finished, when the war finished, he went back underground again, back in the mines. And that, um, he, he was a very strong man, though he was a few inches shorter than myself. Uh, he did his garden, he loved his garden. He, uh, he would go out doing his, digging his garden up before he went to the mines in the morning. And we had to be down underground by half past five. And he loved his garden, but I, you know, it, it's, I've never loved my garden. I turned this into grass and that when I could, and the trees around, that's hard work cutting them. But I, uh, yeah, I, you learn to work when you're down underground, or in the mines as such. Um, you had very, very hard work. Um, you had to learn all the trades before they would allow you to go into a specific trade down there. So I, I did a, a number of different jobs down there um, during the first few years uh, because you just couldn't go in and command a real money uh, saving or money producing job. Um, so we, we had to learn and then I met Maureen, the wife, and we had a little family and so I, I needed more money. So I kept on to the under manager down there and eventually got tired of me asking and, and gave me a place on a coal face. Um, and, but you had to learn that job, so you, I couldn't go just in and do it. I had to go in and learn the trade from another gentleman, uh, a tailgate. I, I can explain that, but <laughs> yeah, we had to learn the trade there. And then eventually I was given the place on my own. Now, um, we were given uh, stints, it was called. When you're learning, you have a six yard one and you get so much money for extracting the coal in that six yard stint. And it was six yards long by three, four foot deep. And we had to extract that coal every day. 
chop it out. It was cut along the bottom first, but it, we had to then dig underneath, force it down, break it up, and then throw a conveyor belt behind us. And we were working in 14 to 20 inches. On the 14 inch face, my shoulders touched the floor and the roof at the same time. Now that, that's a bit hard to envisage. I, tell, I go down the museum and I tell people about it and they, they cringe and they can't, I don't think you can really see, I mean, which is sort of this, that's almost 14 inches and you've got to crawl into the face and the face is 50, 60, 70, 80 yards long and you, you can't, this, your thighs are more than that, you just go pull yourself in and you've got to dig that coal out. It's very dangerous or it was very dangerous and very hard. Um, we just wore a pair of trousers and boots. We didn't wear other clothes because it wore out so quick being on the floor. We, uh, our skin gradually, on the hard gravelly floor, imagine lying on that with gravel on there as well. And then imagine your skin tearing in that, plus your hands blistering and all that. And because it was so low, when you're digging with a shovel, your knuckles were hitting in the roof all the time. So the hands got like rock as well, because they gradually got toughened with it. The way we hardened our skin up was we weed on our hands and rubbed in our bodies. That held, held the wounds and hardened the skin. And when I fished on the finish underground, I had hard pads on the shoulder and the hands were, they were like rock. You know, I got a couple of busted fingers there as mementos of it, of the low ground that is, because I, I was learning the trade, I was helping a chappie um, down in the tailgate and because it's only 18 inches and you're throwing s stones like that into the background you're crooked over on your knees and down just throwing it like that and I didn't leave go with the stone quick enough and that I bust those fingers open and back in our days we didn't get paid if we didn't work so I, I had those in bandages for 12 weeks and I didn't, but I didn't lose the day's pay I, I kept working because we had to you didn't, you know, it's not like today's society. We're giving money, or they're giving money, people are giving money for doing nothing. And that's what, it's, it, it's hard for people our age to stomach how things are being run today with the country. But anyway, from there, you know, we just went on and did the years um, working down there. Until such time as me, my father, in 1961, he, um, had an accident on the same face that I worked, uh, which by that time we'd found some higher seams of coal, probably two foot, two foot six, three foot, and we had to adopt a different working procedure. Um, Dad worked on a different shift than me. Uh, he wasn't qualified to go on this particular face that I was qualified to go on. Um, he had, because of his difference in jobs, um, Anyway, I was down the snooker hall down Radstock, or the Victoria Hall, practicing my favorite sport at the time. And the phone went, and they were calling me to say that my father had had an accident. And with that, I drove straight up to the colliery, which is the one the other side of this drammy here. Um, and the main first aid man, he was come, had come up from Rithlington to there, and I thought, well, God, be serious then, if Dad's had this, you know, he's come up there. So I asked Fred uh, what uh, his injuries were, uh, and he wouldn't tell me or couldn't tell me. And I was a first aider down there as well, and a firefighter. And I, he, uh, he, he just wouldn't tell me. So we waited around a while there. Um, we waited long enough for Fred to decide that uh, we, it was long enough. So he said, I'm going down. So he picked his lamp up and I said, well, I'm coming with you. So I got my lamp. And we then went down the pit. Uh, I met my father about a quarter of a mile from the pit bottom. And he was on a stretcher and he covered in blood. And he had the stones falling on him and it crushed both his legs. And this arm, both the bones were broken and protruding. So I had to tie dad onto a stretcher to get him in the cage because the cages weren't very wide. You couldn't lie out in a stretcher. So I had to put loops around dad's shoulders and hook, hook him onto the stretcher, uh, put him in the cage and then I brought him up. I got, saw him into the ambulance. I went home because I lived on top of Rithlington Colliery and I gave, I told the wife what had happened. Uh, I, washed, I had to wash his blood and change my clothes too. 
uh, go in the hospital because we're going to follow him into hospital. I had to call in, tell the mother what had happened, uh, and mum was going through the change in life, so she was having, I can't remember the problems now, but I thought, well, I can't tell her everything because she might have one of these uh, fainting attacks or something like that, and I, and I needed to get in to support dad in hospital. So I only told her one of the things that had happened to him, you know, only one limb broken. I then chased into St. Martin's Hospital, which was the A&E at the time, caught up with dad in a corridor. He was still a lot of lead on his stretcher, and he saw me coming, and he held up his good hand and he said good job it wasn't this one Selwyn wasn't it because he he spoke with a Welsh accent I, I'd never acquired one and I said why was that dad he said well, I wouldn't have been able, wouldn't have been able to done my horses or pools so he could see some good in it you know so I thought well after that you know dad took a long time to recover from that and he never fully recovered because one leg was shorter than the other this arm that was his wrist was locked in a position so he couldn't go back to work and uh, I thought, well, I can't afford to have that happen to me because I, th I probably had the three girls by that time. And I thought, I can't, just can't afford to have, have that happen to me. So I decided to leave the pit. Uh, I managed to get away in late 62. At that time, I didn't know whether conscription had finished, which is you're called up to go in the services because that was, you, you had to back in those days unless you were uh, unfit to go into the services. Um, the only way you could escape it was by being in the mines or on the land, farms. And as I was underground, then I wasn't called up for my national service as such. Uh, but I was a, I, before I finished there, I didn't want to have to come out of the mine and then go into the national service because I didn't want to leave my family that I'd made, you know. So we, uh, I, I left the mines when I knew it was safe and I went out on the road then driving heavy goods vehicles, um, which was a, a lot better than being cooped up down that hole. Yeah, and it's a, when you said you did um, kind of a training period and like just starting off there for the first time, was it? Yeah. It must have been quite a lot to get used to and also working with your dad, what was that like? Well, well I didn't work with the dad actually, uh, we were on different shifts, but the, the, I remember the first day I went to this training centre, it was a 16 week training period we had, and I got to the top of the pit shaft for the first day we was going to go down and I mean, never being down there, didn't know what was there. All you see was a cage come up through the hole in the ground and then it disappear underground. And I was standing up there, my kneecaps were going up and down my <laughs> brain in, uh, I don't know what, apprehension I think it was at that time, not, not excitement, but I, I couldn't stop them from going up and down or vibrating, whatever you like to call it. It, it was... Uh, sort of a bit frightening and then we got down to the bottom they stopped doing what they were doing about halfway down and I got down to the bottom we started walking in I thought I can't breathe now because they're changing air down there and I thought well, I can't breathe there's something in there and I saw the other chaps uh, going on I thought it must be alright they must be able to breathe so I I thought well I, I can't be alright so I, I just kept going and it was just a difference in air quality down there but during the course of the time that I've worked or trained, I've seen young chaps come there and go get to that same stage as I was. I was having a panic attack, I think, just a tiny panic attack, thinking I couldn't breathe. Uh, but I, I've seen chaps come to that, get to that same situation and turn around and run back to the pit, pit bottom, that is, in order to come out. They couldn't take it. So it was, there was lots of different things that were frightening down there. Did, did you have to have a certain kind of... Um or develop a certain kind of personality to do the job or certain characteristics? I think you needed a, a very hardy uh, characteristic to do it because working in sort of a 14 to 20 inch face and having to get 10 tonnes of coal out on a daily basis for the money that we were getting, you need to be, um, you know, what do you call it? You, you need to be sound in body and mind or, or gone up in the mind. <laughs> because um, it was a very hard work and because of the coal extraction you could always hear the roof banging which was cracking and uh, crushing down and always in the background the you could see the, the timber that we used to support the roof that would split and you could see that and you could always, like I say we worked in a fear a lot of pain and or discomfort 
and um, energy output. Because to you know, when you've got a shovel, sort of that size, and you got a shovel about ten tons of coal led down onto a conveyor belt, you you just I mean people nowadays can't understand that sort of uh, work output. I don't think because they they're not not expected to do it nowadays. And also, they, how uh, common were accidents then? Regular. Yeah. Now, I mean, I, I became a first aid man down there, and you, I would, I mean, I had my job to do, but I mean, you were treating small injuries all the time, uh, like my own fingers for a start. Um, there was one chap that I was really amazed he wouldn't, at, at the outcome of it, um, I was working the, the second man in on this particular face, and we had a, we had, would have 10 foot roads driven through the rock and either end or 80, 90 yards either side would be six foot roads height and then the coal would be extracted between the two so the 180 yard face and it was on about the second stint in and we heard this fall of rock one day and the screams and we scrub it out from within the face and there was this chap from Timsbury I've forgotten his name just at the moment but all you could see was his head and the, the rock front there had fallen on top of him and the boulders that were on him, <laughs> you just couldn't believe it. Uh, anyway, we managed to uncover him and we got him on a stretcher and we had to carry him then probably a mile, bent over out to the pit bottom and, and get him up to the ambulance and then go back and do our work, finish our work, because we didn't get let off anything for being first aid men. Uh, we heard next day that all he had was bad bruising now you wouldn't believe it if you'd seen it because of the size of the rocks that were holding him down. It's impossible to believe that you know, he could have got away with such minor injuries from it. There was, there was also one gentleman that was killed. I think he probably went through a wrong procedure. Um, the, the conveyor, no, sorry, the, the cutter that he was driving, which was a, probably a nine foot long, large motor, was a yard wide about a foot high because it had to go in these shallow places and it had like a, a jib on there with like a chainsaw at the end but it would cut into the coal and he probably he probably i think he was in between the coal and the cutter and he turned it on and he got squashed between the coal and the, the machine so that was the only death that i saw down there I, it didn't actually see it happen but i saw it if you know what i mean um but there was there were always lots of injuries i also the only relic i've got from those days is a photograph which is up down the museum on display down there of um, our firefighting team a photograph taken of us down in uh, Combran stadium in south wales because every year here we used to have uh, firefighting competitions and it, they would put a, a course of sleepers and props in uh, Welton Rovers football ground and we would have to run out this, pay the hoses out and connect up and do a, a circuit in a specific time. Well, we won it several times uh, from our pit and the photograph was uh, one from when we were down South Wales uh, competing against the rest of the nation as such. Uh, we won it one year down there which was uh, quite pleasant but the bridge wasn't built then. We, uh, we had to go all up round Gloucester. Neither of the bridges were built then, uh, or across on the ferry. And being my hometown then, or home country then, if we went back, we would either be on the train or we did eventually get cars and go back over across on the ferry. We watched, I've got film of the um, bridge being built, the first bridge, first day M4 bridge. Um, so we've seen a lot happen in our little lifetime, right? Yeah, quite a lot of change. So, yeah. I mean, if you don't mind me asking then, because I'm kind of shocked to hear that you, you finished doing that in 62. Yeah. Uh, how old are you? So in the 75th year now. Yeah? Yeah, I was 74 last month. Do you, do you think um, kind of adopting that attitude and uh, that kind of work ethic from being down the mines has kept you fit? Definitely. I've always worked hard. Um, I've, I've never wanted to do anything other than work hard. I wouldn't want to be sat, I tried in a factory once, but I, even when I were on the lorries, I was loading and unloading blocks and bricks by hand, 
so I've always been fit. I played football till I was 50 and running past kids a third of my age. And I, I only took that up at 30 because I got bored with, not bored with snooker and that, but back in our day, or that time, the only thing on the TV at that time was pop black, and that was in black and white. <laughs> so there wasn't, I didn't seem to have anywhere that I could go because I was the Wessex champion for three consecutive years at snooker and the local champion and all that. So I, I needed another challenge. I need a challenge to survive. Um, so I then took up football with my wife's brother because he played for a local big team. I, I just went up there training and the first night nearly killed me because I had food before I went and they trained them rather hard and uh, I was rather sick because I put myself through it. But I thought, I'm not going to let it beat me. And eventually, I got f as fit as the, because they were paid a little bit, I got as fit as them, but I couldn't play football. But I learned eventually. Uh, we, I did youth work for a tidy few years, run assistant leaders and that, and we started a little team up uh, from the youth club members that got too old to play in the youth team. Um, it sort of developed from there. and I. We ran it and organised it for about 20 years and had a great time. And you, I, you don't sound like the kind of person who could live in a city doing an office job. <laughs> Not on this earth, mate. Not on this earth, no. No, I got to be out in the country. I mean, as you know, I play golf now and I, I, I still play for the county seniors. Now, they, they start at 55 and I'm still representing the county at my age. I managed to win, I played against Wiltshire a couple of weeks ago and I managed to win both my games then and that was against a Welsh international was one of them and captains and some very good players on the other side so I compete, I'm not dead till I, the nationals in the coffin. <laughs> and then also because, I mean from what you're describing from the mines it sounds like the kind of thing that uh, I know I certainly kind of have like kind of nightmares about and I haven't even experienced it. You must have some kind of like, it must be quite strange having memories of that. And Yeah, well, when I worked down there, I used to get the nightmares. Yeah. I don't get them about being down the mines now, not very often, but I, I don't sleep well at, anyway, but I, the dreams I have, I mean, I, I'm dreaming all night, but when I was working down there, then I dreamt from, you know, that I, I was down there. I was dreaming that I was down there several times a night, getting the coal off, and going through it, I mean, you're going through it physically when you're dreaming, and then I would have to get up at half past five in the morning, five o'clock, sorry, and then go and do the real thing. And I'm, I'm very tired from doing the dream steam, really. It's, uh, but I'm, I say, I, probably other people uh, don't get the same problem as me with sleep, but um, I, I did have nightmares about it down there. Uh, and you, I can't understand why, if, anybody didn't get it because it wasn't a very nice situation to be in. That's better, that was hot, wasn't it? Sun going. <laughs> yeah. And it's, um, and so how, in, in terms of like, because you've lived in Somerset for so long, uh, yeah. well, what, uh, with Somerset, did you move here because of the mines? Or? We, we came across from South Wales for dad, for work. Hmm. Uh, dad came over and then mum and I followed. And that was in 1937. But you haven't wanted to move away? No, it's a lovely part of the country. You can't beat this. You know, we got this house. Uh, I, I was given this house just after I left the, the mines. It was a council house, uh, but we purchased it, and I've got nothing that way. Um, I, you won't get that in a city. I hate cities. I hate going to Bath. I hate Bristol. What would you think that is? Um, I don't know. It's, it's just everything's on top of you. And it's lovely on the golf course. Nothing else around, is there? You know, it's such a freedom. You may not play good golf, but it's such a freedom. You could go to my golf course, which I can see across the, the country from here, and you can see seven counties. And I can see the sea at Bridgewater. I can see down as far as Minehead or past Minehead on a good day. Uh, but you're in the clouds, obviously, if it's a bad day. But and that's the sort of thing I like. I don't like hustle and bustle. I don't like going to the pubs very often. I don't drink anyway, but we go out for meals and parties and that. But and that's because 
well, because it used to be smoky environment for one, and then the drinks for another. It's all trouble creating uh, pastimes that. Uh, yeah. So I. Uh, no, this is this is doing me. We won't be moving here until we go that way or that way. <laughs> Probably that way for me, but. <laughs>